Good day, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. You can always visit us online at mymdi.org and download previous episodes of the Daily Torah Podcast. Contact us and let us know what you are learning so far. Today we are on day two of this week's Daily Torah series called Peku Day, which means accounts of. Yesterday we opened our Torah portion with the inventory of materials used in the construction of the tabernacle. Today our Torah portion continues with the making of the garments of the priesthood, the ephod, and the breastplate. If you have your Bibles and notepads handy, get them ready or listen and review later. But let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. In Exodus 39, verse 1, we read, Of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold in the thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple it together. It was coupled together at its two edges in the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. And in verse 6, And they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold. They were engraved as signets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, my friends, this passage describes the creation of the priestly garments, specifically focusing on the ephod and the breastplate for the high priest. Here's a breakdown of the verses. The ephod was a significant part of the priestly attire, made according to the command and description given in Exodus 28, uh, verses 5 through 14. It was crafted from blue purple, and scarlet thread along with fine woven linen. Gold was beaten into thin sheets and combined with the colored threads to create artistic designs. Shoulder straps were added to couple the ephod together and an intricately woven band adorned it. Onyx stones engraved with the names of the sons of Israel were placed on the ephod's shoulders as memorial stones. Now continuing in verse 8, And he made the breastplate artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. They made the breastplate square by doubling it. A span was its length and a span its width when doubled. And they set in it four stone, four, four rows of stones. A row with a sardius, A topaz and an emerald was the first row. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jainthith, an agite, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold in their mountings. There were twelve stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names, engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the twelve tribes. Now, my friends, the breastplate was also made in accordance with the instructions that were given to Moses back in Exodus 28. It was artistically woven using gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread along with the fine linen. The breastplate was square when doubled with a span for its length and width. And then these four rows of precious stones were set in it, representing the twelve tribes of Israel. And chains of pure gold connected the breastplate, and rings were placed on the shoulder straps of the ephod. And the breastplate was bound to the ephod with a blue cord, ensuring it remained secure. 
Now, the symbolism of the stones and the high priest's breastplates, also known as the breastplate of judgment, this sacred garment held great significance in ancient Israelite religious practices. These stones collectively represented the 12 tribes of Israel, emphasizing their unity and unique contributions. The breastplate served as a reminder of the high priest's role as a mediator and intercessor for the people. Now let's turn to our half Torah portion in 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, verses 6 through 8. In 1 Kings 8, starting in verse 6, we read, Then the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. Now, my friend Solomon was very careful to obey what God commanded about transporting the Ark of the Covenant, that it was only to be carried by the priests. The Ark of the Covenant was the most important item in the temple, but not the only item. They also brought in the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense from the tabernacle into the temple. Now, let's look at our Brit Hadashah portion for today in Hebrews 9 and try to put all this together for today. In Hebrews 9, Verses 6 through 10, Paul writes, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. In verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Now, my friends, only the high priest could enter the holiest of all, and that too only once a year on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur. The high priest offered blood sacrifices for his own sins and the sins of the people committed in ignorance. This practice emphasized the need for atonement and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit revealed that the way into the most holy place and the God's presence was not fully disclosed while the first tabernacle was still functioning. Gifts and sacrifices offered under the Old Covenant could not truly cleanse the worshiper's conscience. These rituals were external regulations temporary in nature, and unable to provide ultimate redemption. The Old Covenant's practices served as a shadow or illustration of the reality to come. They pointed forward to the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua the Messiah who would establish the New Covenant. Remember I, I said before, each covenant builds upon the other. It does not replace the other. It is like the, the building upon a firm foundation. Each one is transferred and elevated to a higher level, bringing us to the new covenant. Through Yeshua's shed blood, believers can now approach God directly and find true forgiveness and cleansing. His sacrifice provides eternal redemption and access to God's presence. Now, my friends, if you have not listened to our series on covenant versus replacement theology, 
please take some time to go through that series and understand that the Bible is true from Genesis to Revelation. There is no replacement theology. Everything continues to function, but in its own time and essence and bleeding us into the time of Yeshua's sacrifice. And now we await for his return where we will be changed and our sins will be truly forgiven and we will become immortal, sinless spirit beings just as Yeshua is now. So my friends, let's end it here for today. Take some time to meditate on these words and how they apply to your life. Pray for us in this message to go out and pray for those who are scattered throughout the world seeking their Messiah so that they will return to the Torah in their Hebraic roots. Share this message with your friends and family. Post a link on your social media pages and help us spread the gospel. You never know whose life you may affect. And remember to visit us at mymdi.org. Take one of our free classes. Download the daily Torah schedule. You can also order the Daily Torah series of books to follow along. And if the Lord inspires you, please consider becoming a monthly sponsor so we can reach more people with these messages. Just click the giving menu option or donate button on the website. So tomorrow we will continue our studies. Until then, Shalom Aleichem, blessings and Shalom, my friends.